Good evening. Please take your seats. We're about to get started. Welcome, everyone. My name is Sebastian Burke. I'm the Director of Corporate Programs at the Council. We're thrilled to have a great audience tonight and are delighted to welcome back to our platform Professor Luigi Zingales. I'd also like to thank our sponsor, Zurich, for their generous support of this very important series. Please know that this event is on the record, but feel free to use social media. I'd also please ask you to silence your phones. And we are also live streaming. I'd like to highlight a few of our upcoming programs in the spring season. On February 25th, we have a George Friedman of Strat4 on the new global hotspots. On March 3rd, we have a great panel on China's envir environmental regulation and the implications for business. And on March 4th, we have a, our annual Global Health Symposium. We have a lot more programs uh, happening this spring, so please check our website. I will rejoin to moderate the Q&A, uh, but before, I'd like to welcome to the stage to introduce our speaker, Mr. Will Trumbull. He is the Chief of Staff to the Chairman of North America of Zurich Insurance Group. Please welcome Will Trumbull. Thank you, Sebastian. <clears throat> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Zurich and the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, I'd like to thank you all for joining us for the second event of the Spring 2016 Global Economy Series. Zurich is pleased to support this program and recognizes the need to convene uh, multiple stakeholders on such important issues. Earlier this year, we were delighted to welcome Professor Tyler Cohen and Randall Krosner for a lively conversation on the future of money. And next month, we look forward to welcoming back to the Chicago Council and the series, the former governor of the Bank of England, Lord Mervyn King. Lord King will engage in a conversation on the modern financial system with Bethany McLean of Vanity Fair. Tonight, we are delighted to welcome Professor Luigi Gonzalez to share his perspective on Europe's current situation and future prospects. As you know, Europe is facing some complex challenges. Despite ongoing European Central Bank stimulus programs and low energy prices, the economic recovery remains elusive. Furthermore, the internal dynamics of the European Union are also strained by increasing security concerns, the migrant crisis, rising populism, and a potential Brexit, among other issues. Many suggest Europe's efforts of social and economic integration may be halted, and by definition, even reversed in the near term. At the intersection of political and economic policies is often a loud nebulous of biased perspective, crippling debate, and the ability to create and implement meaningful policy outcomes. Fortunately for us, we have Professor Zingales here to clear the air and tell us what's going on in Europe and what the situation in the future may be. You all have his uh, full bio in his chairs, but let me please uh, briefly highlight a few of his achievements. Professor, Gonza Prof Prof Professor Zingales is currently the Robert C. McCormick Professor of Entrepreneurship and Finance at the Charles M. Harper Faculty Fellow at the University of Chicago Booth, Business, Booth School of Business. He also serves as Director of the Stigler Center at the University of Chicago. A Fellow at the National Bureau of Economic Research and the European Governance Institute and is a member of the Committee on Capital Markets Regulation. Professor Zingales' research interests span from corporate governance to financial development and from the political economy to the economic effects of culture. He's also co-developed the Financial Trust Index, which is designed to monitor the level of trust that, I have, that Americans have toward their financial system and has offered, authored several books and numerous articles. Born in Italy, Professor Zingales carries with him a civic passion and the belief that economists should not just interpret the world, but they should change it for the better. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor Zingales. So thank you very much for this uh, invitation. It's a pleasure and honor to be here. And, uh, it's also a lot of fun to discuss about uh, Europe. Now, the great things about Europe is that you can put a title, what's next, even like 
three, five months in advance and still be very sort of uh, right to the moment because uh, Europe is a gi gift ki that keeps giving uh, with a lot of problems that keeps coming. So foreign economies is a fantastic uh, opportunity. Uh, but what I want to do tonight, I don't want to talk too much about the little details about Brexit because uh, to be honest, we economists know very little about number one, what is going to happen if sort of uh, England exit the Union. And uh, most of our forecasts are based on uh, what other people think, and we don't know what other people think. So there is very little we can say about this. However, I would like to have a broader discussion uh, about, paradoxically, the size of nation. So why, all of a sudden, uh, Scotland wants to leave uh, the United Kingdom, uh, Catalonia wants to leave Spain, uh, why there is all this secession going on all over the place? Uh, this brings a more fundamental question, is what keeps country together? And I will start to analyze it from an economic point of view, and then I will go more into political issues. And uh, one of the challenges of uh, being an economist is that if you want to be a good economist, you don't you cannot be just an economist. And so I will venture in fields that are not necessarily my own, so I apologize if I'm not as competent as uh, uh, I should be in all those fields. But there is a trade-off between saying nothing precisely and precisely nothing. And <laughs> all too often, economists go in the direction of saying precisely nothing. And uh, today, I would go in the opposite direction. We, maybe I will not say some, uh, many things precisely, but hopefully, uh, I will not talk about nothing. So um, let's think about what are the benefits of a big country. So as an economist, the first benefit is to have a large market. We learn from Adam Smith that the specialization of labor is intrinsically linked to the size of the market. If we are in a small country with a small market, then we cannot specialize labor enough, and we cannot achieve very high productivity. If we are in a larger market, like the United States or like Europe, then the opportunity to specialize are bigger, and that creates uh, productivity benefits, and so the, the economic pie becomes bigger for everybody. So that's a big advantage of a big nation, except for the fact that the European Union actually proves you can obtain many of these advantages without being a single country. So in the old days, you, when, uh, in 1945, you, if you had to compare Europe with the United States, you said the United States is a market of 200 million people, and Europe is a fragmented market. However, between 1957 and 1992, uh, Europe integrated its market without any political integration. So you can obtain many of the benefits of a market without being uh, actually a common country. The second benefit is that you can produce public good more efficiently. So think about defense. Uh, you have to defend yourself whether you are teeny tiny Switzerland or you are the European Union and, uh, or the United States. And uh, Switzerland spends much more in uh, per capita uh, income in defense. Why? Because uh, you still have to have a critical mass to fight an enemy. And if you don't uh, have uh, a big country, then uh, you find it more, more difficult to uh, uh, afford to do that. That's the reason why before the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, there was a strong pressure being united. Scotland will never think about leaving the, the rest of the United Kingdom if there was a threat of a Soviet invasion. Because Scotland by itself will not put up a great fight against the former Soviet Union. Uh, the third thing is in a, a world that is becoming more and more integrated, many problems are world problems, but certainly not local problems. And starting with pollution, we know that pollution is a global problem, certainly is a regional problem. So it's funny that in Europe, Germany and Italy decided to have no nuclear plants in their territory, but France has plenty of nuclear plants, 
And surprise, surprise, they are all located at the borders with Germany and Italy. <laughs> so uh, it would be useful to have some regulation that trying to internalize this externality. The last characteristic which is important is risk sharing. So if you have a major natural catastrophe or economic catastrophe, if you are a big country, you can afford to pay for it. Think about uh, a, the Katrina disaster in the United States. Uh, the rest of, of the Union can send a lot of money to Katrina, to the area hit by Katrina, to try to sort of uh, deal with that. Uh, if Louisiana was an independent state, it would have been much more difficult to cope with that. So these risk characteristics are important. So if there are all these benefits of being a big country, why everybody wants to be a small country these days? So one thing is actually the cost of political coordination. Uh, it's much easier to go along when you are fewer people and fewer homogeneous people. Uh, we always wonder why Sweden and Denmark work so, well, work so well. And the answer is, in part, is because they are all ta tall, blonde, and blue eyes. They all look the same. And so it's much easier to get along if you look the same. We know that the willingness to redistribute, to help each other, is stronger when you look alike. And that makes the political game much easier to play. And even in the United States, if you think for a second what would have happened if there was no civil war and if the South was separate from the North, I think political coordination would be much easier. The North would be kind of a Canada and the South will be sort of a, I don't know what, but a different kind of <laughs> country. Um, the second uh, reason why it's convenient to be small is if you want to prevent redistribution. So if you are Kuwait, you are very happy to be small because you're full of oil and you don't want to share it with other neighboring countries. So uh, there is a strong incentive for rich countries to actually secede. Now part of the story under, under the S Scottish uh, secession where about uh, still the revenues from oil. I think that now with the oil at below $30 a barrel, probably their desire to secede is reduced. The only movement I know of an area that is really poor and want to secede is Corsica. Corsica wants to secede from France, but it's not particularly rich, and it's actually the receiver of a lot of aids from, uh, from France. But nevertheless, they are fiercely independent. But in general, I think that's a big incentive to be um, small. And in fact, the vast majority of the richest country are actually small country. So it's not obvious that being big means being rich. The last thing is, is actually easy to free ride. What does it mean free ride? You can take advantage of your neighbors. So in particular, if you're small, uh, you don't have the incentive to set up a big army and uh, you let somebody else go ahead. Uh, we know that the United States play more than their fair share of policemen of the world. Uh, why? Because uh, uh, Panama say, I'm small, why do I care? I let the United States go ahead. And the same is Canada and many other countries. So it is easier to free ride as it is easier to have regulation that take advantage of your neighbor. If you are Liechtenstein, you have the most tolerant banking law in, in the world, uh, lowest tax rate in the world. Uh, you welcome all the sort of uh, potential uh, money launderer of the world because you don't care. They commit their crimes in different country. They don't pay their, ca their tax in different country. And you take all the benefits at no cost. So it's much easier to free ride as a small country than as a big country. This is from an economic point of view, but as I said, the economist perspective misses a lot of important consideration. So first of all, uh, the, the no notion of nation as we know it today is a creation mostly of the 19th century. And 19th century Europe, in you, you create a national identity basically to fight against 
the neighbor, neighboring country. Uh, the idea of German nationalism arose in Germany after the defeat by Napoleon. And the notion that you have to create a French identity came to France after the defeat by the Germans in 1870. In fact, the Ministry of Education of France after that defeat said we need to create an educational system that indoctrinate the superiority of the French people and the French culture in the world. And I have to say they succeeded pretty well. <laughs> now, these notions are very important if you want to have an army, generally a conscription army, that fight for you. And Many of the progress in creating this sense of identity, including uh, universal franchise and sort of uh, the uh, social welfare, were the result of devastating wars in Europe. So uh, countries in Europe, unlike the United States, got universal franchise at the beginning of the 20th century uh, or immediately after World War, II, World War I to, to sort of uh, either promote a, a national army or to reward a national army that fought very aggressively in, in World War I. And uh, a lot of the social welfare was created in, war, uh, in, in Europe after World War II, after these this people fought very aggressively, and in part also to prevent internal revolts. In this is, the social welfare was an idea of Bismarck, uh, at least the first version of social welfare, in ideal Bismarck, and was designed to uh, reduce the power of the Socialist Party by uh, anticipating some of the moves pushed by the Socialist Party. B Bismarck was able to contain the power of the Socialist Party for a long period of time. And clearly, until there was a powerful threat of a Soviet, communist Soviet Union, Europe had to provide social welfare in order to make sure that there wasn't a social revolt that would justify the Soviet to come in. And this, until 1989, was a serious problem. Now, all these issues basically disappear uh, recently. Um, but uh, the military threat, by and large, is gone. There is a terrorist threat, but it's a different threat. The military need for a conscription army is gone. There is not a conscription army in the States, no basically major successful country today as conscription, because the, the war of the 21st century is a technical war, and it doesn't pay to have too many people train for it. Um, and I think that uh, if you are a bit cynical, you can say that also the fear of revolt is gone because uh, the Communist Party is not that strong anymore and the Soviet Union is not there to finance those revolts internally. Um, so many of the conditions uh, have changed. And now in this setup, we can analyze where we are in Europe. So now that I gave you the general picture of how sort of trade-offs between being big and being small have changed over time, and how there is a still a leftover of a national spirit that is a leftover of the uh, 19th century. Now let's look at uh, how the unification process took place and, uh, and where we are now and when we can go in, in the future. So first of all, uh, most Europeans were raised under the idealistic view that uh, the unification process in Europe was done to avoid another World War II. And when you are confronted with the devastation and the horrors of World War II, and, and World War I for what matters, anything is worth avoiding that. And so every time the politicians in Europe want the, the, the people to swallow something that is terrible, they say, that's the alternative. And if that is the alternative, anything goes. However, very few people challenge the notion that being united is really the secret against fighting another war. I don't think there is statistical evidence in that dimension. And if you look at the United States, if I remember correctly, since 1812, you did not have a war with Canada, in spite of the fact you're not unified with Canada, but you had a civil war uh, in spite of being unified. So, uh, is being unified is not a recipe against the war and unfortunately does not guarantee you against war. So that's not the real reason. So how did Europe get formed? 
I have a particular view, I think some historians differ on this, but I have a particular view, which is supported, in my view, by a lot of documents, that say that Europe was basically created by the French to avoid the dominance of Germany, the dominance of Europe by Germany. So if you are General de Gaulle and uh, begin at the end of World War II, you realize that your country has been invaded by Germany three times in, one, in two generations. And you know that Germany is economically and militarily more powerful than France, so you need to do something to block the regrow of Germany. And in fact, the idea of France was to keep Germany broken down, not just on the line of East and, and, and Western Germany, but also to have a French protectorate of all the area with coal and steel that also happens to be near, uh, near France. And this probably would have, fly, would have flown if it wasn't for the fact that the Cold War came along and the, the Americans said, we need a strong Europe to fight the Soviet. So we cannot afford to have a subdivided Germany. You have to have at least a united West Germany. And, uh, and so the French decided maybe if we create a uh, union between the two, uh, we minimize the risk of having another war with the Germans. And so uh, the core of the uh, European Union, that was this uh, agreement for coal and steel, was basically a French-German agreement with a lot of small countries that were participating to this big wedding. And those are clearly the Belgium, the Netherlands, and Luxembourg, and Italy, which is not more small geographically, but is more uh, politically. And it's particularly small at that time coming out as a defeated nation after World War II. So this was the idea behind uh, the European Union. And the problem of this is that Europe was created with a very French German mentality. So the French are very Cartesian. So they know that there is a right rule and they apply to everybody and because they know it's right. So compare sort of uh, the meter. The meter is a typical French invention. It's very logical. It corresponds to nothing that we know. <laughs> There's no sort of uh, uh, intuitive notion of the meter, okay? But it's very logical and uh, they determined was the right thing and they imposed on everybody else and actually worked. Uh, in, the, in the United States, we still use inches and feet that are not as logical, but they're more sort of uh, empirically based. And uh, I think the distinction between the vision of Europe that prevails and the, the United States and also England, and this is in anticipation then for the risk of Brexit, is that Europe is very much driven by this uh, Cartesian rationality, which we impose things from the top to everybody else. And they are the opposite of an empiricist approach a la Locke, in which you try and you adjust over time. Uh, the, the French never try. They really do things right the first time, except that they have five constitutions in the time the Americans only had one. Uh, so, uh, but this idea was brought to Europe with the notion that we have to have one market and one law. Actually, I had the privilege a couple of weeks ago to see the last speech of Justice Scalia alive, uh, which was given at New York Club, and was about globalization and the law. And he made this phenomenal analogy to say, look, the uniform commercial code in the United States was not something that was imposed by Washington. Was a different states putting together what seems to work and eventually becoming a standard that applies to most states in the United States by voluntary adoption. The law in Europe is exactly the opposite. There is one law that is decided in Brussels and is imposed to everybody from Finland to Cyprus, regardless of the differences within the area. And this is a big problem because in the United States that are much more homogeneous, you have a lot of flexibility. 
in Europe that are so, were so different, then you have so much false homogeneity. There is a, an Italian thinker, uh, actually from Naples, of the beginning of the 18th century, that said that uh, uh, constitutions are like uh, suits. Uh, every person has the right one, or every pe pe people have the right one. So you don't want to impose the same suit to a Finnish guy and a guy from Greece, because either one will freeze to death or the other will sort of uh, sweat to death. You need to have different kind of clause for different people. And the same is true for constitution. But in Europe, the idea is not one market means one law. And this has created a lot of sort of problem. The second problem, and this is within continental Europe, is I would say the difference between the German view of rules and the French-Italian view of rules. Uh, Germans, when they sort of uh, adopt a the rule, they expect people to follow the rule because it's written down and so you follow it. Uh, the Italian and the French think that the rules are just starting point for re renegotiation. <laughs> and so this creates a lot of tension between the various parties because one say, oh, we've written the constitution or we've written the agreements and the other say, yeah, but we never meant really that. That was a starting point. <laughs> now, if you think that I am uh, biased culturally against one or the other, I can tell you that the French President Mitterrand, when the master agreement were signed, told in a uh, speech in front of the French people that uh, the, the French will have more power to direct monetary policy in a more expansionary way because the French will have more power within the European Central Bank. And if you look at what happened, clearly that was not the case, and, and uh, that's, uh, that's a problem. Now, in this sort of a, a unification process, uh, I think that uh, much was driven by this view that people don't really understand the benefits of Europe. We need to force unification down their throat, and eventually they will see the light and will rejoin. And this was the so-called uh, Monet view of unification of Europe. This was forced basically up to, up to now. And the creation of the euro was part of that process in which, again, the French-German tension, when Germany had to reunify, uh, the French were afraid of the excessive power of Germany. And so they wanted to bind the power of Germany. How did they do it? By forcing a common currency. And so one commenter at the time said sort of uh, uh, that uh, coal got one Germany and uh, France, uh, France got half of the Deutschmark, uh, which is in a sense the agreement that was done at the time to, to do this. And again, the other country at the periphery, they were kind of forced to join. In particular, sort of Italy joined late, not late, but qualified late, uh, because they wanted to enjoy a lower level of interest rate, and they want to borrow somehow the credibility that uh, Germany had, and they made an e a gigantic effort to qualify, uh, cheating a bit on the budget, uh, but to be honest, the German cheated too. Uh, so it was just a question of degree. And finally, once you let the Italians in, why c you cannot let the Greeks? So, they, the Greeks were let in at the last minute, and of course, if the German and the Italian cheated on their budget, the Greeks did it with gusto, okay? <laughs> so uh, that created the condition for uh, the situation to uh, not go so well. And this sort of, uh, this uh, system uh, worked relatively well until there was economic expansion, there were no major problem. And then two major problems arrived. Number one is, a Euro crisis that, unlike most uh, uh, Europeans, I think was not caused by the U.S. crisis, was triggered by the U.S. crisis, and I will mention in a second. And the second is the, the migrant crisis that uh, is a dramatic crisis uh, that I will not talk too much about it because, honestly, as an economist, I don't know uh, what to do about it, but is a, a dramatic phenomenon that is impacting negatively the view of Europe. But 
So the fundamental problem of the, that led to the euro crisis was the fact that the euro was an incomplete decision. So every economist will tell you that you cannot have a common currency area in a very economically different area unless you have some form of fiscal redistribution. And uh, the United States, whether you like it or not, have quite a lot of fiscal redistribution. When uh, Louisiana is in a crisis, nobody says that we don't send money to Louisiana because they're lazy. But in Europe, when Greece is in a crisis, people do say we don't want to send money to Greece because they're lazy. Okay, so this is a fundamental tension between Europe and the United States, is that in the United States people feel, even if there are different, etc., they belong to the same country. In Europe, the notion of is mostly about your national identity, and slowly over time we are building a European identity. The new generation, the generation of people born after 1982, actually experience uh, the Erasmus program that allow them to travel across Europe, etc. they slowly are feeling more European. But it takes 50, 60 years of that in order for this to work. And unfortunately, we didn't have those 50 or 60 years because the creation of the Euro without a political integration created a dramatic tension that we were not fully able to resolve. And the result of this is that people now are starting to become disaffectionate with the European integration process. But really, their disaffectionate is not so much Europe. They are reacting to a number of phenomena that happen above their head, or which Europe seems to signify what's happening. So what they are afraid of of the economic insecurity that came with globalization. And they fear sort of uh, uh, that, and they uh, regret the good old days in which there was more segmentation, in which the political entity could actually take care more of the local needs, not looking from a general perspective. They fear dramatically the influx of, uh, of foreigners. Uh, seeing the foreigners as the cause of their losing ground, when is exactly the opposite. There is a beautiful study that shows that in England, the immigrants since 2000 are fiscally positive from the budget of uh, the British government. So they contribute more fiscally than they cost in terms of social security and health and so on and so forth. And that's true of most immigrants because generally who immigrates are young and healthy people. And young and healthy people pay taxes if they are legally immigrant and don't tax the social security and the healthcare system very much. So from an economic point of view, immigration is actually a great deal. And even from a sort of a income distribution point of view, it's true that immigration, especially with lower level immigration, tends to affect more the salary of the lower class, and that creates more tension. But this impact is relatively small vis-a-vis -vis what is perceived. So why people, especially less affluent people, hate immigration so much is in part is because of a misperceived causality. You know, in uh, Tsarist Russia, uh, people were killing doctors because they noticed a correlation between doctors coming into villages and the spread of smallpox. And so they thought that doctors caused the more smallpox. Why? Because there was a strong correlation between the two phenomena. So you see that you are getting poorer and poorer, and there are more immigrants. It's pretty easy to make the connection between the two, even if that's not necessarily the case. But the second is, and this is important also for the US view of the world, is 
when you are losing out in the economic game, you are getting more and more attached to whatever you are left. And some of these are the values and your identity. If, you, if your income double every 10 years, being French is not such an important value, but if your income has not increased in the last 30 years, then you must have something that drives you, and being French is extremely important. So French nationalists, like British nationalists, like some form of German nationalists, are the result of this phenomena that have nothing to do with Europe, but are associated with Europe. And so the risk is a form of anti-populist reaction that takes different forms in different countries, but as a common element. And the last of this common element is a hate against an elite that is perceived by nature an international elite. Uh, we know, this is true also in the United States, that uh, who is highly educated, who is at the top of the income distribution, has two characteristics, has benefited tremendously from the last 20 or 30 years, and by nature, by ability to speak multiple languages, by traveling, is international. So if you are at the top of the income distribution, you are naturally internationalist, and you love sort of uh, unions, you love bigger country, you love the world. If you are a poor middle class person, and now the two worlds are not in contradiction because you are middle class, in most countries you are becoming poor, and you don't speak foreign languages, and you don't travel very much, you identify the Euro elite as the elite to fight against. And this is really what's happening throughout the continent. So let's analyze one by one. So what is the pressure for Brexit? The pressure for Brexit comes mostly from a traditional British middle class who feels angry that London has been invited by foreigners who earn more than they do, that the world is not what it used to be, and trying to fight against that. And the deal that Cameron has reached has nothing to appease this. The fact that they cannot be to, in, a, in a closer sort of deal with Europe is completely irrelevant. And what is going to decide whether England stay in or out has more to do with the feeling of disenfranchisement of the middle class in England than with the actual deal that Cameron signed, which, by the way, will never be enacted until the referendum, and maybe will never be enacted. So uh, this is a completely different game, but it's the same game of why the Front National in France is so powerful. The National Front in France is about preserving the French identity and, by the way, the French welfare system against Europe. And uh, the new alternative for Deutschland that is projected to win at least 12% in the next election in, uh, in Germany is very similar to the National Front. In Greece and in Spain, this anti-European sentiment manifests more on the left than on the right. Why? Because they have, in short memory, a very harsh right-wing dictatorship. So uh, being right-wing in Greece or in, 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 in Spain is much more difficult than being right-wing in, in, uh, uh, in France. And in Italy, actually, we have both, because we have the Five Star Movement, which is a transversal movement, which is anti-European. And then now, even uh, the, the part that used to be the Northern League, they wanted the secession of the North with the, with the South, now has become a Le Pen movement talking against the elite in Europe. So what are going to be uh, the outcome of this? I am very nervous because I see two outcomes and none of which is really great. 
One outcome is that uh, uh, at some point, the tension will be so big that countries will start to break apart in Europe. And could be Britain exit, exiting, and that would be devastating for the rest of, uh, of Europe in terms of also balance of powers within Europe. Could be Greece leaving or kicked out uh, at some point. Uh, could be Italy or Spain or Portugal deciding to leave in the middle of a crisis. Uh, if a bank were to fail, a major bank were to fail today in Italy, uh, and is not a very remote possibility, Italy cannot do what uh, the United States did when the banks were failing, try to help the banks, and will have basically the banking system collapse. And if you are a prime minister and you have the choice between letting your sort of system collapse or reintroducing your currency and leaving the Europe, uh, leaving the euro and Europe, probably you're going to choose the second in a very traumatic way. So all these are distinctive possibility. However, I see an alternative that I'm not saying is worse, but is equally not great. You know the analogy of uh, the frog in the boiling water. Uh, they say, I never tried the experiment, they say that if you put a frog in cold water and then you turn on the fire not very high, then the frog never understands the differential in temperature, so will never jump out, and you can boil the frog, and uh, the frog will not leave the pan. And I think that this might be the situation in Europe, in which there is this sort of attempt to struggling through all the crises, putting a patch here, a patch there, and, uh, but, we are already seeing devastation in the continent. So in Greece, more than half of the young people are unemployed. In Italy, half of the young people are unemployed. In Spain, half of the young people are unemployed. And I don't remember the statistic in Portugal, but I don't think they're that far. There is a massive migration from Southern Europe to Northern Europe. And there is massive discontent in Southern Europe. And there is an analogy that I always use that most people don't know, but is pretty scary. Italy got unified in a way very similar to the way Europe got unified. A small elite of bourgeoisie thought that there was this idea of Italy and forced down the throat of everybody else with a bit of luck because in Italy, in two years, we went from being seven separate states to be basically a country. And there was a lot of luck involved, a bit like European integration and the creation of the euro were part of circumstances and luck. But then what happened in Italy? In that situation, what rules you will apply? Because Italy is created and, and followed the Descartes view, you wanted to have one rule apply to all the country. And which rule, if not the rule of the North, who was more advanced? So the rule of the North was applied to all uh, the, the rest of the country, creating enormous inequities and inefficiencies. I give you an example. Italy in 1860 had a uh, par uh, partial franchise, like most countries in the world. And this partial franchise was based on income and ability to read and write. This law was very progressive in Piedmont, where most males, at the time we're thinking about only male suffrage, most males were actually literate. And so that rule was limited, but not so limited. Now, you apply the same rule to the South, 90% of males were illiterate in many areas. However, seats were allocated on the basis of population, not voters. So, in the South, few barons controlled electoral seats. And that's not democracy, it's a disproportionate power given to few barons in the South, which decided to trade off their power in exchange for protection of their property right in the South against everything else. And so the result was a, the South was convicted 
to lower growth. Very few people know that when Italy got unified, Sicily had the same per capita income of Emilia Romagna, where Bologna is. Today, Emilia Romagna has almost twice as much the per capita income. So the unification under an hegemony of the north over the south with bad rules created two things, created massive immigration. Most of the Italians you see here come from the south and come from that region. And number two, underdevelopment. And the two actually feed each other because you know that the one who leave are the smartest and the bravest. The one who are left behind are not the one who are gonna revolt and change the country. So the departure actually creates more stagnation from both a political and an intellectual point of view. And the result is a desertification of the southern part of Italy. And my big fear is that the muddling through of Europe will lead to a desertification of the southern part of Europe. The fear is that the European Union, and particularly the Euro area with these rules, is creating a mezzogiorno of the entire southern Europe. And with this sad image, I'm opening for questions. Hold on. Sorry, this is not on. Can we turn this on? Thank you. Thank you, Professor Zingales. So we will take questions. Uh, please wait for the microphone. If you have a question, raise your hand, and my colleagues will bring the microphone to you. Also, please make sure that your question is a question and not a comment. We have one here in front, please. Phil. Thank you very much, uh, that, was, that was great. Um, actually, two quick questions if I can. The first, what about the idea of a two-speed Europe that seems to be suggested in the negotiations they've just had with Britain? Do you see that as viable? The second is, what is the important of free, importance of free movement of people? So if Schengen breaks down, what do you see as the economic importance of that? Okay, they're both excellent questions. The two-speed Europe, I think, is, in a sense, even two or three, is an excellent idea uh, that was against everything that has been taught and told us up to this moment about Europe, uh, which, as you said, is somewhat introduced now with this agreement with Britain. Uh, in a sense, is uh, might have a lot of uh, uh, disruptive power in a situation in which you already have a one euro area. This is, if I were God and I could change things overnight, I would tell you we need two euros. We need the Northern European euro and the Southern European euro. Uh, there are two problems with that. First of all, where do you place France? Uh, because French people uh, think that they don't belong to the club mad, as they call Southern European countries. Uh, and they feel they're part with Germany. If you look at their economic numbers, they look more like us than the rest. So I think that's problem number one. Problem number two is how do you go from here to there? And actually, there is a way, and I designed this way, but requires Germany to leave. This is it's much easier to leave from the top than to leave from the bottom, because if you leave from the bottom, you have a, a bank run. If you leave from the top, you don't, but you pay some cost. So it's not in the interest of Germany to leave from the top. And uh, the Southern European countries cannot leave from the bottom. So I'm not so sure that it would be optimal to leave. But even if I were to be certain that Italy were better off in a separate currency, I don't want to be the prime minister overseeing that. Because I would be hated for the rest of history. So, you need somebody to go ahead and do the job, and then somebody else come. But uh, you go first, OK? <laughs> uh, the second issue is uh, Schengen. I think that Schengen is the only idea of Europe that young people have. So uh, as a normal European, you don't see uh, much of the free trading goods. You might benefit from it, but you don't really perceive it. Uh, there are two things that you perceive. If you're young enough, this ability to go to college in other countries 
that's great. But if you're not young enough, the only thing you remember is big borders where you had to wait for a long time when you're trying to go on vacation, and a place where there are no borders. And that is your image of we are one country. So if you want to create a common European spirit, which is necessary to support a common currency, uh, then you have to sort of uh, uh, keep Schengen alive. Uh, one thing that I do often when I, look, when I sort of speak with a European, I show them a $20 bill. And I say, you see the $20 bill? Why this piece of paper is worth something? It's worth something for two reasons. Number one, there is a common power that guarantees it. It's called the White House. And then on the other side, there is a common hero. Now, most people don't think about Andrew Jackson as a hero, but nevertheless, he is a past president and is part of the collective American history. Now, I don't have it handy, but if you look at a 20 euro bill, you find on one side, there is an image of Europe because there is no common power. And on the other side, there are some buildings that look familiar. And uh, I always ask people, do you remember them? And everybody is sort of embarrassed because they think they don't know well their house history because they can't really place those buildings properly. And the answer is, those buildings don't exist. <laughs> so Europeans were so much a country that they felt that they couldn't share some heroes or some buildings. And so only in the coins you have local heroes, but in the banknotes, you have fake buildings. And now, the irony is that now the Netherlands is building a bridge that looks like <laughs> the one in the 20 euro bill. So this is how Europe is created the other way around, is you start from an abstract idea and you force things down the people rather than you start from a common feeling and you create a country. So I think in this process, Schengen is the nail in the coffin. If they start to break down Schengen, the next thing you're going to start countries leaving the Europe. That's my prediction. We have one over there in the middle, please. How successful has been the Erasmus program that enables students from all over Europe to study in other countries? Um, it has been extremely successful in creating in a younger generation a spirit of Europe. And uh, that generation, I think, uh, could be the beginning of a European spirit. Uh, my view is if we had kept Europe as a common market and uh, a place of free circulation of goods and capital and people for 50 or 60 years, maybe we could have created a European spirit. Unfortunately, we tried to push uh, too fast. And now we have a tremendous backlash because 20 years ago, uh, the Germans were not calling the Greeks lazy and the Greeks were not calling the Germans lazy, uh, Nazis. And now the irony is that both of these statements are completely the other way around. If you look at the statistics, Greeks work more per week than the Germans. They're less productive, but number of hours work is more, okay? And if you look at the electoral statistics, there are more Nazis in Greece than in Germany. So these stereotypes did not used to be thrown at each other's throat 20 years ago. Now they are. And that's, I think, the backlash of failed economic policies that make more difficult to have a common European spirit. We have a question here in the second row, in the middle of the second row. Given your critique tonight, should Serbia and Bosnia and Herzegovina suspend their efforts to join the European Union? Actually, no, because the best part, and thank you for this question, because I forgot, the best part uh, that we should be thankful for Europe is the application process. I think countries did their best stuff in order to qualify to enter that market. And in fact, one of the biggest uh, responsibilities of Europe is to have dropped Turkey out of that picture. 
I've been in Turkey in 2002, and Turkey was making a gigantic effort to be a European country. You could see it everywhere you, go, you went. There were symbols, this is the biggest shopping mall in Europe. I said, you know, I studied geography. It's a teeny tiny place of Turkey that is physically in Europe. Still, they wanted to consider themselves European. And they started to treat nicely the Kurds. There was a completely different world in, because they were in the waiting process to be part of Europe. Then, basically, they were abandoned. And now they're drifted into being a Middle Eastern country. Uh, so the application process is great. The problem is that once you're qualified, you can do anything. It says, if Orban becomes a dictator, is there a way to expel Hungary from Europe? No. So uh, I think that the carrot of a big market to trade in was a very powerful way to lift institutions and give good example. I think that the other big benefit of Europe is we have not seen dictatorship uh, going back. In a sense, I don't know if today Greece would not have become a, in, again a dictatorship if it wasn't for Europe and certainly made it very easy for countries like Portugal and Spain and Greece to become Western democracy in a short period of time. So that part is fantastic. And, uh, and I think that uh, the irony, is, speaking about size of country, the very country, Slovenia, Croatia, Serbia, Montenegro, and now wants to be together in Europe fought to be separate from Yugoslavia. <laughs> so uh, why? Because Europe, at least part of Europe, wants to be just a common market. And I think that Britain is very comfortable in being in a common market. And I think all Europeans, including Turkey, will be happy to have a common market. Now, the part that you will really need to have unified in Europe is defense. Defense and dealing with the problems of immigration. Now, what are the two parts that are not put in common? Defense and immigration policy. The Greeks and the Italians are alone in facing the front end of immigration, and very little money is given to them to actually deal with that. So if you are a Greek and you say, wait a minute, why am I left be alone in this fight. It, that's the one fight that should unify us. Remember at the beginning of my talk, the provision of public good is done better by a bigger country. So the European Union should start from having a common market, should move into some obvious low-hanging fruit, like common policy against immigration, or pro-immigration, depending on the point of view, and a common defense policy, common policy from an environmental point of view, because we're too close to separate the environments, and then only with time we can have common currency, a common everything else. And I think, unfortunately, we inverted the order. Okay, in, in the back, over there. In the middle, in the back, yes. What is the current role of Russia in this conversation, whether it's trade or military might or sheer ideology? Uh, so what, what's the, how does that play itself out? Uh, that, that's a very interesting point because uh, uh, Russia in this moment is not a threat yet to the European Union, uh, but is a very powerful trade partner. And the, here you see uh, how divided Europe is. Uh, where you need a common defense and honestly a common foreign policy uh, because if we don't have a common foreign policy, Russia will pick and choose and uh, make every European country weaker. And that's exactly what is taking place. So when the first sanctions were introduced, uh, Italy was trying to stay behind. Why? Because uh, Italy has more of a trade uh, uh, with Russia and everybody else, so was trying to play the free riding game. Now, Italy was forced to go along, now it's Germany that tries to play the game. And of course, if everybody else joins, there's a strong incentive to deviate. That's the reason why you need a common defense and foreign policy. But that's exactly what Europe 
does not have. So that's the drama of Europe. For the things that are needed the most, there is the least. For the things that are needed the least, there is the most. Over here, this button, no, fourth row. Thank you. Thank you very much for your insights. Very interesting. Um, I'm the Consul General of Bulgaria, and I would like to ask you, what is your vision about the common European energy policy and strategy? Um, that's another excellent example of something that uh, uh, will need to be done together, uh, but it's not. Uh, there are too many divisions. And, and to be fair, even in the United States, there are tension from here and there. And even in, in, in US history, you have a lot of regional tension. Uh, what is the big difference? The big difference is you all elect uh, one president. And that president has some responsibility vis-a-vis -vis the entire country. Europe does not have this. And uh, you see, the example is Angela Merkel is a phenomenal politician that did very well the interests of Germany. Not the interests of Europe, but the interests of Germany. When she tried to have a grander view, like hosting the immigrants, she runs the risk of losing the next election. So these people are not that uh, everybody say, oh, these politicians are too short termists not short termists, they are elected on a regional basis and they have to respond to a regional electorate. And it's very difficult to have a common energy policy when at the end of the day, everybody is elected regionally. So sure, I would like to have a common policy, but I am elected in Baden-Württemberg or I'm elected in Milan and I want the interest of Milan or Baden-Württemberg before the common European interest. That's, that's the fundamental problem of Europe. Okay, fifth or sixth row here in the middle. Hello, as you can probably tell by my accent, I'm um, an English European. So my question is going to be, uh, should the UK vote in approximately 17 to 18 weeks to exit from Europe? What do you think the economic consequences would be to the US given that uh, the US um, is negotiating a transatlantic trade agreement, and given that next year it celebrates 10 years of an open um, air agreement, open skies. So my answer would be in steps, in a sense. Uh, uh, you have to tell me from the perspective of whom. So from the perspective of Europe, I think it would be devastating that Britain leaves. It would be devastating for two reasons. Number one, provides a useful political balance to the various sort of uh, forces in Europe. And uh, number two creates a, a very strong precedent that might unravel pretty quickly. Uh, from the point of view of Britain, uh, I don't think it will make a gigantic difference either way, because probably they will arrive at a compromise. So unless there is an escalation of retaliation, et cetera, it's not going to be a disaster either way. Uh, probably, long term, Britain is better off in Europe because it's difficult to run a financial center of Europe not having the same currency and not having the same rules and not having the same anything. So I think that if uh, London wants to remain a financial center for Europe, now may decide they want to be a financial center for the world, that's feasible, but I think remaining makes more sense. For the United States, I think as long as there is not a turmoil in Europe in general, I don't think makes a huge difference. In fact, maybe it's likely a better deal because clearly the way the exit is perceived in Britain is we get closer to our cousin on the other side of the ocean and farther away from the continent. Uh, so I think that uh, there will be a natural, stronger interaction with the United States. However, it's still true that 50% uh, of foreign trade uh, today in England is with Europe. So if Europe were to boycott or do some major sort of uh, responses, which I don't think they will, that would be very costly economically, at least in the short term. Okay. Over here, second row, please. You said in, in Europe, at least in Southern Europe, 50% of the young people are unemployed. 
uh, I know that's true throughout the Middle East, and it may well be true in Central and Eastern Europe too, I don't know. As an economist, can you comment on the effect of having so many young people without jobs, even with having good educations, and from the social or, or political standpoint, w where is that going over the next 10 or 15 years? Um, I think is actually uh, unraveling pretty quickly uh, for a couple of reasons. First of all, uh, the best people who are unemployed leave, and uh, this is uh, great for them, is uh, bad for the country that they leave behind, not only for the reason I told you earlier, but also because you leave behind a lot of uh, debt. So if consider sort of Southern Europe, they have a lot of debt per capita. If some of the capita people go away, the remaining people have more debt. So it makes the sustainability of the debt much more difficult to, to do. And uh, the other thing is we know that uh, uh, there is learning by doing, and also not only in learning new techniques, etc., but also getting used to be unemployed. So uh, once you stay unemployed for two years, your chances of getting back in the labor force are much, much lower for life. So this is not a temporary shock, it's a permanent shock. It's a permanent shock about the productive capacity of a country. And I've not even started to analyze the political ramification because it's really not my cup of tea. However, we know they're not good. Do you think, uh, this is a little related to the last question, but do you think the social democratic uh, political structures that uh, in Europe broadly uh, w would be uh, uh, negatively influenced by this economic fragmentation that you've been describing? Uh, uh, you know, compared to the United States, Europe is, is much more uh, social democratically oriented more in, in the direction of welfare states and it, w it would seem that, that that political structure might be threatened by the economic fragmentation you're talking about. Actually, I think that the social welfare is sort of threatened by number one uh, the uh, economic conditions that are getting worse and worse and number two even more important uh, demographics uh, is very easy to promise a lot to a lot of people when you have a growing country both in terms of uh, GDP per capita and in terms of per capita in terms of people. Uh, this is the best Ponzi scheme that we know. You sort of uh, pass to future generations some liability because they get there are more of them and they are richer that liability is smaller on a per capita basis and also in terms of burden. So in, in the 60s, when we were expanding entitlement and running a huge amount of budget deficit, this was very doable uh, in a growing economy. Today is not. And so this is the tension of Europe, is the pie is shrinking and uh, the social welfare needs to be shrunk unless we want to have massive immigration, which population does not seem ready for. So uh, how do you manage this? And uh, what you try to manage is by saving yourself against the other. The fragmentation is the attempt to save what you have, trying to not share with others. So France say, we have a good welfare system. We don't want to share it with Spanish and Italians because ours is better not understanding that all this welfare system will be somehow impacted by the lack of growth and, and the lack of population growth. So I think that uh, uh, is much more difficult to run a democracy with a tight budget constraint. And I think this, this is what we are all experiencing, in part also the United States, but less so because demographically the United States are in a much better shape. Second row here. Front. Could you say a few words about the effect of terrorism 
Uh, both the new terrorism that is affecting Europe, the jihadists of one sort or another, and also some of the old, say like the IRA, and, uh, some things that are still sort of simmering, what effect will that have on European stability and, and uh, economic growth? So I think that uh, uh, one negative aspect of uh, terrorism, of course, has a lot of negative aspects, but one is to uh, generate fear. And under fear, people tend to uh, not reason, but have knee-jerk reactions. And so immediately after the terrible attack in Paris, what did Hollande do? Number one, he blocked the borders, the borders, as if most of the terrorists were coming from abroad. Actually, most of the terrorists are homegrown. So blocking the borders makes sure that they stay inside. They don't, cannot go back. So it does not make any sense, but is the natural reaction you have. Uh, is like, as human beings, we are programmed when under fear to freeze. Why? Because in the savanna, if a lion is attacking us and we freeze, maybe the lion does not see us. If you are in the middle of the street and you see a car and you freeze, it's the worst thing you can do because you're sure that the car will hit you, okay? So many of our instinctive reaction might be good in the savanna uh, 100,000 years ago. They're not good today. And I think that terrorism generates many of those, like the hate for the people who are different and, and so on and so forth. Um, but I think that the question we should ask more is, why there is so much ingrown terrorism in Europe. And I think that in this respect, Europe has a lot to learn from the United States because I think that a lot of the terrorism inside Europe is driven by the dissatisfaction of the immigrants that are never considered fully equal citizens, whose opportunities are tremendously lower and at some point, if you feel discriminated, if you feel you don't have a chance, if you feel your life is going nowhere, then you're more likely to be prey, to be sensitive to some crazy ideas from the Middle East. And we have time for one more question here at third row, please. That was a marvelous presentation. I'm another British-born American citizen. Um, I'm intrigued by your explanation of the Brexit support. You suggest it's uh, pressure from a disenfranchised, newly poor middle class. How do you explain then that um, what, over 300 uh, conservative members of parliament, half the conservative cabinet are now supporting Brexit, Boris Johnson, the mayor of London, the financial capital of Europe, supports it. How do you explain that? This is the beauty of uh, markets, including the political markets. Where there is demand, there is supply. So there is demand of people in favor of Brexit, and politicians who are smart go where the demand is. So uh, I think my view is Boris Johnson went for Brexit because this is the best way to become prime minister. So it's not some grand vision of what this is all about. Um, there is a small fraction of the Tory party that is still enamored of uh, the old England and very much afraid of the continent uh, having fought two wars to make sure that the continent did not go the wrong way, uh, which is um, in a sense very important. I, actually read recently the speech that Margaret Thatcher gave in Bruges in 1988. And it was a very prescient speech. And uh, she said, uh, and she had some guts to say that in front of all the European representatives, she said, we are here next to the burial sites of, an, I don't remember how many British, who fought to make sure that the continent did not got unified under the wrong rules which I think is a powerful reminder that it's not unification at all costs. I think that there are some levels past which unification is a negative, not a positive. I don't think we are there yet, and especially from the point of view of uh, Great Britain, 
who has all these special privileges, including of having their own currency, I don't think that the costs of being in Europe are bigger than the benefits. Uh, but it's hard to explain this to people. And says, the best example, I think, is with immigration. Uh, the average British guy benefits tremendously, tremendously from immigration. So why there is so much resentment against immigration? And uh, The Economist had a beautiful piece comparing Cambridge with a similar town, I think it's Petersburg, another town that is in the suburb of London. Uh, they're very similar in every, in every dimension, except two. One is level of education, and the other is percentage that will vote for Brexit. In Cambridge, I think it's 12 percent. In uh, Petersburg, is 80 percent. And that is really the divide. Uh, if, you are, if you are in Cambridge, you only benefit from interna internationalization. If you are in Petersburg, you're not. And honestly, and I leave you with this beautiful image, what is happening there, what is happening with, uh, with uh, Le Pen, what is happening with Grillo in Italy, is not that different when what is happening in the United States with Donald Trump. And on that note, thank you very much. That's all the time we have.